Welcome to Sustainable Farm Insights, a sustainability programme brought to you by the Irish Farmers Journal and Lambia Ireland. The economic and environmental challenges facing Irish farmers is well known and the aim of this programme is to help tackle these challenges and assist Irish farmers across all enterprises to adopt good management practices and new technologies as they drive to deliver economic and environmental sustainability on their farm. My name is Andy Doyle, I'm Tillage Editor in the Irish Farmers Journal and I'm on the farm of James Ashmore uh, to talk about soil health. Uh, we're talking soil health because it's an important part of all farming enterprises and also we're doing this uh, as part of the programme called Sustainable Farm Insights which the Farmers Journal is doing in conjunction with Glanvia Ireland. And for the discussion here, I'm joined by David Wall, who is a soil scientist and a soils expert from Chagask and Johnstown Castle, and also by David Cooney, who is an agronomist with Glambia. James, we're now going to talk about tillage because you're a tillage farmer. Can you just explain to us the type of farming that you're doing, what you're growing, and how you're managing the whole land base that you have access to? All right, Andy. Uh, we're, well, we're a mixed farm with beef and tillage, but uh, we run... Um, sort of a nine year six crop rotation. We have uh, three years of grass, followed by maize, then going into winter wheat, winter barley, then cover crop, which we're standing in now, of uh, fodder rape, leafy turnip, facilia vetch. Then we're going into uh, peas, followed by gluten-free oats, and then back to winter barley again before we go into grass. So you have a very diverse rotation. The one thing that's unfamiliar in that, I'm guessing, to most tillage farmers, maybe two things. One is the catch crop that we're standing in because lots of people still don't do it or don't do anything even to replace it. And the other one is the really interesting one, the three years of grass. You have cattle, so I suppose that makes it easier because you have a market. Yeah, well, I, I don't have to worry about my, where it's going or trying to source uh, my, uh, the market, but yeah, we primarily use it for, with our cattle. I make hay as well, it goes towards the uh, equine market. But I find it's good for kind of breaking the, uh, we're in a plough based system, so it's kind of breaking that constant tilling over and over again, kind of uh, give the chance to soil to recover, build up your uh, beneficial bacteria and, or, and fungi as well. So uh, it's advantageous in that. And also we uh, fatten store lambs over the winter, so it gives us another market, another way to earn a few extra quid. And it's three years of no shaking about and that's a, yep. a plus for the soil to improve itself. Yeah it's also a way we uh, primarily apply our slurry out on grassland so it's another way to get uh, other nutrients back out as well and the farmyard manure that we produce all goes back out in the tillage ground as well. Uh, farmyard manure is this thing from slurry or, or both? Uh, we've both yeah okay. we've uh, straw bedding and then we've got slat, slat shed as so well. So you're, you're running a, a circular system you're taking nutrients from here putting them over there taking them from there putting them back here. Yeah we, we try to keep a closed system as much as possible so we're not in, uh, bringing in any uh, outside unwarranted uh, things like black grass or that. And can I ask just as a direct follow-up from that James I've always advocated that having land uncultivated in any way for a couple of years is a great help to decrease the pressures, general weed pressures. Are you finding that? Perhaps you're not, whether it be grass weeds or any weeds. Well, I suppose with the rotation we have as well, you're, because you have the different crops, you're uh, dealing with different types of weeds and it kind of alleviates pressures, especially when you have a, a change between spring and winter. Uh, certain weeds are getting suppressed by having it in grass because uh, any uh, weed bank that would be in it gets it'll die out after a few years. Well, one of the things that strikes me is that you, you have a big concentration in what you've said on getting soil into good working order. You have your three years break, you have your, your dung and your slurries coming out and you have your catch crops going in. They don't happen automatically. You're doing it to try and improve the general quality of your soil. Yeah. And the question then is, are, are you improving the quality of your soil? Do you think you are? Uh, how, and how can you see it if you are seeing something? Well, I've seen a bit of resilience starting to build up in the system. Like in 2018, we were, well, we were slightly affected, but compared to other people in the area, we didn't suffer as much with the drought. Even in 2020 now as well, we didn't have too much, uh, nothing major anyway, but even workability of the soil as well, it, it, it's getting better. Plus, uh, keeping a, uh, preventing winter erosion by having something growing there as much as possible, preventing uh, wind and water erosion, so it helps uh, keep it all together. I don't want all my uh, nutrients running off into the neighbouring farm. So in general you would, you would believe that by minding the soil 
you are making life easier for yourself because if you're if you're increasing the workability of the soil you're making it easier to get your planting done yeah physically diesel wise yeah and speed wise yeah and you're also helping many other things in the process yeah well it just makes life easier and again the resilience is important it might be hard to put a, a monetary figure on it but if you can kind of prevent yourself from the extreme or help protect yourself from the extremes it's a lot easier and would you say on balance year on year that you're doing a little bit better than the fellow over the fence and I don't mean that to insult any <laughs> neighbour but it's just you've done every, you're doing everything right in the soil the theory is it gives higher yields yeah well again I suppose the keeping a living root in the soil as much as possible you're getting as much carbon down into your soil and it's feeding your microorganisms and building up your bacteria and fungi your beneficials and that can only be positive and compared to some of the neighbours I, I would be seeing some improvements all right okay well you've mentioned biology in the soil feeding the roots getting the carbon down i'm going to switch now over to david wall and ask david about how other farmers uh, can can begin to bring that biological life back into the soil well actually in terms of feeding the biology here james is actually doing it he's doing it here in, especially in this field um, where the uh, cover crop or catch crop is serving in multiple functions so we're on a slopey field, as, 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 as James talked about. There is the potential on a slopey field that the soil starts to wash off. So having this living crop here, the roots holding that soil together, especially a tilled soil that's already after being broken down. But maybe we'll have a, a look in and, and see what we're, we're, uh, what's happening here underneath the, the soil. Because James has been working this soil for so long, trying to keep it in good work and order, we expect that we'll have a soil here that's much more friable than an awful lot of other tillage soils. Uh, that's what I'm expecting. Yeah, well, and, look at And I'd be very surprised <laughs> if it's not what we find as well. No, I'll take this one up from the side now. And we'll see what we, we have. Oh, crikey, there's a lovely pr soil profile that literally was locked together by active plant roots. It's, yep. it's terrific and to see that. You can look see at how deep they are, big roots going down there. Yeah, like if we look at these in terms of the, 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 the fodder rape or, or, or that, they're really getting down there. That tap root is opening up the soil there um, over, the, over the winter. We can see here some of the evidence of the biology colonizing around those roots. So we see that there in terms of, of, of larvae and, and, and eggs. So they are some of the, the, the bigger biology, there's earthworms in there. But essentially what we have here is something that's feeding that biology, uh, especially at this time of the year. We're in the, the winter period. Usually you wouldn't have a source of food in there, especially on worn tillage ground. But what, what James, what you're, what you're doing here is you're putting, putting in the, back in that food over the winter period by having a growing crop. That's pumping carbon. It's also pulling up nutrients from the depths that will be there for that seed when you're planting your cereal or whatever is next in the rotation here. Um, that's going to be closer to the surface when that seedling with the small root is there. David, the one thing that strikes me looking at the, the sod you have in your hand is the length of the root for what looks like a very mediocre plant on top. It's a small plant, but yet it's doing so much work under the ground. Yeah, look at that's 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 key. I suppose it's testament to the work that has been put in on this ground that that root is able to get down that deep in such a a, a short period. Obviously, out of season of of the main growth, it's still getting down there. And as you say, it's doing a lot of work in its own right in terms of pumping down carbon, um, creating uh, food there for the biology, and then also pulling up. Uh, uh, the nutrients that may be lost below the root zone um, that typically happens in a field, we'll say, with no green cover over the winter. So if, if what James said earlier and what you're saying now would be true, that all of that soil that's there, which in your hand has been held together largely by plant roots. Yes. If you let that fall now from where you're holding it onto the ground, that probably will all just fracture and go all well, over the place. It's the ultimate test for, for structure and let's Let's have a look. So typically, this is what 
you would do in terms of, of, of going out and testing soils, uh, looking at their structure and everything. You dig out a, a block like this and let it fall and see what happens because uh, it, it, it's natural. So, and if we look in here, this is a really positive wow. sign. So we have no regular shapes here. They're all irregular. You can see the way that's after breaking down there um, into the different aggregates. They're very friable. I think that's going back to what you talked about, James, in terms of, of the workability of the soil. So it's a lot more workable. And you can see there, it's fracturing, breaking down. And if we bring this back up into shot, you can see there, if I pull that gently, see all the, all the nu nutrients, all the, the soil that's adhering to those uh, roots over the, over the winter, they're all feeding biology. The nutrients is coming back up and being stored in those, and that sets you up for the following crop. And David, when we talk about biology, we're talking about big things like earthworms we can see, and small things like bacteria uh, and fungi that we can't see with our eyes. What kind of numbers would be there in, in, in if you just took that spade we dug up, that sod yeah. we dug up, what kind of numbers of organisms would be in there? Yeah, look, at it's, it's, it's a great question and it, it's, it's a bit mind boggling. So in that simple square of soil, if we think about that in terms of, of, of uh, a simple teaspoon, if I was to, to, to make you a, an answer, has about a billion bacteria it has meters, lengths of football fields, in terms of uh, mycelia or fungi. And then in the terms of- The strings of fungi The string of, of yeah. fungi, if, if you were to measure them that way. So that simple square, we'll say 20 centimeters by 20 centimeter, has trillions, trillions of bacteria that are working away there. Uh, countless earthworms, because of what I'm talking about here, this all is nutrient rich, um, and then uh, bacteria uh, and other uh, fauna uh, that, that uh, are, are working there in the soil. So it, it is truly mind-boggling, but uh, this type of system helps us to feed that system. And if that system is working for you, um, it'll make the soil a lot more resilient in the, in the future. Uh, your crop um, uh, growth is going to be better and your recycling and nutrients is going to be better. So it all works in harmony. Okay, we're going to just move on then and I'm going to just go slip over to, to David. If you take what we're seeing here, how typical is that of what we're seeing generally on Tilly's farms, in Tilly's fields? And what can people simply begin to think of doing to get their land into a, a structure like this where we're widening the window when we can go in and cultivate it and manage it? and where we also decrease the energy requirement. So to answer your question, Andy, unfortunately, this is not a typical tillage field. And probably what's really unique about this farm is the rotation that he has. It's probably one that many guys would love to have, but it wouldn't be typical, as you're well aware, of most tillage farms in, in Ireland. OK, so we, we, have, we have the rotation. What part of what James is doing would you love to be able to bring into a tillage scenario as distinct from like to bring in to a tillage scenario? Well look at the, the, the three year grass lay is definitely something that would, would massively benefit and, and we spoke earlier about you know the traffic trafficability of soil and that and, and the fact that you can rest that soil for three years and put it in there is, is of massive benefit to any soil rotation. The cover crop is probably the easiest one that you know most farmers can do and as James said he has the ready-made market for the grass many many tillage farmers wouldn't have that and land mightn't be suitable for grazing in terms of fencing or access or, or for other reasons so the, the the cover cropping is probably the easiest one but what the one you would most like would probably be that rotational lay that 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 break yes for for structural reasons for weed suppression reasons and Lots of other ones as well. And, and again, and, and it's, it's the variance within the rotation too that he has. So he mentioned he was, you know, going from this cover crop into peas, into oats, into cereals and back to grass and, you know, jumping through different plant species there. And that has to have massive benefit to the soil biology as well. He's jumping through species and some of them are taken out his need for nitrogen. Some of them are giving him a different family of, of pesticides to use to control a problem. And hopefully he doesn't have very many because this type of farming is, is significant in terms of reducing overall pressure. How important is that good physical 
healthy soil to withstanding the weight of the machines that ma most modern farmers have or most farmers have nowadays. So I suppose the challenge is to get to that state and, and you really do need to have your to have your soils. The, the, other, the other point James made about the, the resilience in the soils in terms of drought, we all saw the impact of, of, a, of a relatively short drought this year in, in the month of May and into June and what that did and it definitely showed up on more of them on the long term tillage soils that wouldn't have the organic matter or wouldn't have the rotation. You know the effects of that was quite worse. Was, was worse. And we'd always have thought or said that heavy soils naturally hold more water. And yet it was some of those heavier soils this year that took the biggest beating. Yeah, and, and again, them heavier soils, it's the trafficking they've taken, it's the loss of soil structure, you know, which in turn is the loss of soil, soil organic matter, soil biology. So it's, it's the, the whole, all the factors are contributing to give you that, you know, that ultimate, that healthy soil that allows you in and will produce the crop for you. And for me, the biggest thing about getting all of this right is that as James said at the onset, having that soil healthy is a prerequisite to getting big yields. Yes. Having your soil healthy is also one of the greater ways of taking some cost out of the equation. It could be one herbicide saved. It could be 15 to 30 kilos of nitrogen, depending on where you are in the rotation. All of that lower cost is ultimately contributing to more profit at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, for me, sustainability and healthy soil must be about generating profit for farmers because that's what we need most of all. James, David, David, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. The summary of a healthy soil is that we have the physical, which is the structure, the chemical, which is the fertility, and the biological, which we measure by earthworm of activity. When all of those are working well, then the seat on that stool is providing the ecosystem services which do so much for us. I think it is very important for all farmers to remember that when that soil is healthy, when it's humming, when we're getting those roots growing down through the profile deep into the ground, we're depositing carbon down there. We have roots that can grow more easily. When they grow more easily, the crops above produce more yield. And at the end of the day, the major beneficiary, uh, well, there are two beneficiaries. One is the farmer, because more yield generally is more profit. And the second one is the, is the environment, because we're protecting so many of the ills that we've been talking about for the past number of years now. Thank you for taking the time to watch.